Hello and welcome to Crossover Christian Church. So glad you're checking in with us. My name is Lisea Kelly, pastor of Crossover. We meet in uh, Mount Sinai at the Heritage Community Center there uh, every Sunday at 10 o'clock. We'd love to hear from you, interact with you. Please email me with prayer requests at lesaya, L-E-S-A-Y-A, at optonline.net. So, uh, yeah, we are probably at the end of your week, and I'm, I'm just trusting that you've had a good week. Um, I want to take a few moments with you today just to encourage you and, and pray that you just refreshed in spirit, your emotions, mentally, that God just meets with you and touches you. One announcement that I want to make regarding crossover is that the, the, the middle of August, August 15th, we have our annual beach service at Matatak Beach um, Veterans Beach Park. 10.30 a.m. we're going to do an open air service and communion, followed by a beach baptism. So if you've looked, uh, you've listened in, you've, you've wondered, would you like to be part of this? This is a wonderful opportunity just to interact with us as a community. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about what baptism is, and if you can participate, I'd love to talk to you. So please reach out to me via our, our website, Facebook message. I'm here for you. So um, let's pray together. And, uh, and then I'd like to share the word with you. Before I go into the word, however, I'd like to invite you just to take a moment and prepare uh, some communion elements for yourself at home. It can be a cracker and grape juice, whatever you have. We're going to close our time together this morning uh, with breaking bread together. So let's just pray before we come to the word. And Father God, I just thank you that it is not by accident, but it is always by your leading us in paths of life that we come together, we connect online, we connect in person so that you, Lord, would have your way in our lives. Your will would become evident. So we open ourselves, Father, in this moment to your guidance, to the, your direction from the Holy Spirit. And, and we open up and we ask Father God to meet us, to touch us, to draw us deeper into the fullness of life in you. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the summer, we're doing the series called At the Movies. And we're looking at some of the grand genres and the grand movie themes and, and looking at what life lessons we can draw um, some, some partially from the movies, but some also in contrast, because the, the, the movies provide us with, you know, larger than life entertainment. And it, it's really helpful to uh, consider with discernment what we're watching and whether we're actually swimming with everything culture and all the messages of culture around us or we're actually listening to the contrast points and living in discernment. So today we're at the movies with con artists. This genre can be pure entertainment as long as the con is only on the screen. Uh, everyone, many people have been kind of exposed to real life scams, to cons, and they can be devastating effects, you know, ID fraud, I have friends who've had their bank accounts cleaned out, their credit cards compromised, and it's a huge headache to retrieve, to work through all those issues. But let's come back to con artist movies on the big screen. When the con is good, you get drawn into the point where you actually want the con to succeed. You get scared with the con artists in the moments where they may get caught. You get exhilarated when they get away with the steal. It's pure entertainment when it happens in the movies. But of course, a completely different story in real life, as I've said. As I was looking at this, um, this genre this week, I was reminded of the first years my, my dad went into the ministry. He came in as an associate pastor to a large church um, in, in Pretoria in South Africa. I was only seven years old. A couple of years in, as the church just continued to grow, we had more and more people come in. And one year, I remember um, coming towards December where our 
uh, it was our annual holiday. My dad would take a month off and we would travel across country to, uh, to go to the beach for a month. And there was a lady in the church who'd come to know the Lord and she had offered the pastor, the senior pastor and my dad and their families, she had offered us her Learjet to fly us down for the vacation and to pick us up at the end of vacation. We were ecstatic, super excited. This was amazing. About 10 days before we were due to leave, uh, we were informed that this lady had been taken into a special unit in the hospital because of a breakdown. And we found out we'd kind of been conned along the way. And you, you realize even in, in something as simple as that, the letdown, uh, the sense of betrayal that we experienced as kids is so real, so much more in these big con artist movies. If you're looking at some good entertainment, Netflix series, there's Leverage, a con artist uh, movie series, as well as White Collar. Now, here's the bottom line with con artist movies. It's all about swindling, cheating, lying, and stealing. And yet, it's, it's, it's given to us in such a glamorous package that we get drawn in. So what is the big draw? And I want to give you three big draws from the, the, this genre. The first draw is you get to be part of something bigger than the sum of yourself. There's an energy that comes from the team planning and training together that draws you into a larger than life scenario. When you look at um, series like Leverage and White Collar, what you find is that these uh, teams are drawn together because of different skill sets that are needed. And then they come together and they start to bond and connect over the big plan. And, and it, it just draws you right in. One of the big movies that um, is in this genre is Ocean's Eleven. Less than 24 hours into his parole from a New Jersey penitentiary, this thief is already rolling out his next plan. He follows three rules, and you find this in some of the con artist movies, is they have their own brand of ethics or morals. His three rules were don't hurt anybody, don't steal from anybody who doesn't deserve it. Hello? But yes, don't steal from anyone who doesn't deserve it and play the game like you've got nothing to lose. And Ocean's Eleven was pulling off one of the biggest casino jobs to date. Another con artist movie was The Italian Job. And The Italian Job was a favorite of mine because um, it features a South African actress by the name of Charlize Theron, beautiful. The other reason I love this movie is that there's an awesome car chase with stick shift Mini Coopers, and I would love to reenact that part of the movie. In the Italian job, Charlie has a job to do. Having just left prison, he finds one of his friends has attempted a high-risk job right under the nose of the Italian mafia. Charlie's friend fails. So Charlie takes over the Italian job using the Mini Coopers and a couple of Jaguars and a bus. He hopes to bring things to a standstill to steal the gold and escape. In each of these movies, you find what is essential is a, a, a set of skill sets, as I said, and a team of people who begin to bond over their skill sets. They're planning to get away with the big con. You find this universal longing, even in the criminal element, this universal longing to be part of something bigger than yourself. And that's part of the big draw that gets us into these movies. The second big draw with con artist movies and con artists in real life is that getting away with deception becomes, decept uh, becomes addictive. Uh, getting away with deception becomes addictive. You, you, you actually start probably believing your own lies and, and, and there's something just so enticing about spinning the lie so persuasively that other people come along with you for the ride. Another big movie in the genre is a movie called Catch Me If You Can. And it's actually based on a true life story uh, found in the 1960s, 
where a young boy under the age of 21, his father had left home uh, and he was both bored and, and probably really broken up about his broken home. At different points over the next few years, he posed as a Pan Am pilot, he posed as a Louisiana lawyer, and also as a medical doctor. He traveled all over the States, posing in these three different roles, forging checks so well that he, he literally defrauded people of millions of dollars. There was an FBI agent on his, on his tail for the longest time, and in fact, they developed a relationship. I'm not gonna give it all away to you, but, um, but, but he was on the run and swindling and playing the con, con artist for, for years before, before he finally got caught. He was put into maximum security jail and imprisoned for 12 years, during which time the FBI agent actually started consulting him about other uh, top of the draw check forgeries. And eventually he landed up working for the FBI. So getting away with deception becomes addictive to the point that it becomes a way of life, a mindset. There's an adrenaline feed that comes from successfully deceiving others. Now, this is the movies, I understand, but this can so easily um, pour over into real life. And we're going to talk about some of the life lessons in a few moments. So the big draw of the con artist is, first, you get to be part of something bigger than the sum of yourself. Second, getting away with deception becomes addictive. And the third big draw is that self-gain at any cost becomes the highest priority in life. And here another con art movie is The Good Liar, where a career con artist meets a wealthy widow um, online and, and begins to develop a relationship with her, all the while he's planning to defraud her of her money. Along the way, he comes across some unexpected setbacks. And what you find, I'm not going to give the ending away, but what you find is the con artist is turned around on his ear a little by the, the lead actress, Helen Mirren. Wonderful to go and look at. But what you find underneath and in the middle of all of this is the pursuit of self-gain at any cost. So it, it doesn't matter what harm, what damage is done to the lives of people around about you. In the movies, this is a great genre. It's, it, it's thoroughly enjoyable to decompress and watch a good con artist movie. But what are the life lessons for us in real life? The first life lesson is we are wired to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We are wired from the very moment of conception to be part of God's purpose. You are wired to be part of God's purpose in your corner of the world. And I really want to encourage you. I know you hear me talk a lot about purpose, but I, I believe that just as I spoke last week, God has called you by name and nature. He has a unique fingerprint in the life of every person on the face of the earth. As we wake up to it, we actually begin to step into this fantastic place where we're wired to be part of something bigger than ourselves. There's three elements of God's truth regarding this that I want to share with you. The first is that sometimes we look for company in the wrong places. This is why small-time con artists actually get drawn into bigger and bigger cons, is because they're looking for company in the wrong places. And a movie like this reminds us that according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. So when you spend time hanging around in the wrong places with people who are going in a different direction of life to you, don't think you're not going to be touched, that that isn't going to become a contagious element in your life. So we wired to be part of something bigger, but sometimes we look for company in the wrong places. And if you're in that place where you just feel like you're getting pulled back into some 
old habits, some old practices, then it's time to set some boundaries and actually uh, give yourself some distance so that you're able to regroup and redirect in the ways of God's truth, his life and his light in your life. The second truth here regarding being wired to be part of something bigger is we are wired to share life together. You see this written all over scripture, but especially with the Apostle Paul, who just oozes the love of God and the love of people through most of his epistles. He's always concerned about the people that he's pastoring, that he's shepherding, that he's praying for. And that is just part and parcel of the way God created the body of Christ to be. So Paul actually writes to the Thessalonian church, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. And really, when you go and look at this, impart our lives to you, he's talking about a sharing, an ebb and flow, a give and take of sharing life, breaking bread, personality, relationships, ups and downs, the reality of human life in the hands of God. We are wired to share life together. I was reminded um, of the opportunity that I was given in my 20s to work with my one of my mentors, Ziggy Oblander, who came out of uh, communism in East Germany as a young woman, got radically saved, and God used her as a missionary all over the world. Uh, she visited over 90 countries, uh, bringing the, the, the truth of God's word to remote places like Afghanistan, sometimes on her own. And as she developed and grew, um, she was able to take her husband with her and sometimes teams. So in my 20s, Ziggy had started coming out to South Africa and uh, we developed a, a women's organization that had been started by her with her group of friends here in America called Women of Vision. And all over the country, there were women with vision for um, bringing the gospel and the hope and the truth of God's message to people all across the nation. And so we brought that to bear in South Africa. And we began to go to rural places across South Africa, places um, that probably had not been touched in, uh, in many ways by such a radical message of re revolutionary love and truth and the power in Jesus Christ. And um, I remember the road trips we took, where we, would, we went out into places none of us had ever been, where we had to work with translators. And I, I remember both um, the amazing moments of ministry. For instance, we came to, to one remote region where we had been given a big hall in a local hospital. And as my team and I were getting everything ready, one of my friends just broke down weeping. And I realized I needed to put all the organizational stuff on hold because something was happening here. And the story that unfolded was that um, her mom, when she was a teenager, she had fallen pregnant and her mom had insisted that she have an abortion. There were no legal abortions in South Africa, so her mom had driven her across the border to this remote region and brought her to this exact hospital for an abortion. What was even more unbelievable in this moment was that the day that we walked onto those hospital grounds was a 10-year anniversary date to the day that she had walked onto those grounds to have an abortion that she'd never wanted. I get chills talking about it now, uh, 30 years later, because how amazing is God that he comes, he, he, he brings a full circle like that for a young woman who had been devastated for so many years, had never been able to talk about it. And on the very grounds, we were able to pray and just begin to speak the restoration and healing of God over her life. Just a monumental, miraculous moment. Why? 
because we are wired to share life together. And when we say yes, we say yes to moments like these, to miraculous moments. The third element of God's truth here, that we're wired to be part of something bigger, is that we called, we are called to be kingdom builders together. Jesus taught his disciples, his followers, he taught us to pray, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we begin to pray that, guys, we're meant to become part of the feet. We put feet to those prayers. We step into the prayers to become um, the activists, the, the, the actioneers, if you like, of that. Why? Because this is absolutely written into our DNA. We are wired to be part of something bigger than that. And I have to tell you some of my great experiences of being kingdom builders with others is to go on mission trips together. You can do short-term mission trips. You can go to your local city and just begin to walk the streets uh, with a friend, begin to pray. And I guarantee you, there are gonna be some coffee appointments. There are gonna be some divine appointments. There are gonna be some engagements for you that may be uncomfortable, but you're going to go right out of your comfort zone and begin to share salt and light with people on the street. So the first big life lesson is we are wired to be part of something bigger. The second big life lesson is that temptation can be powerfully enticing. This you see all over the con artist genre. And it's a good reminder for us that we are not impervious to temptation. We are not untouchable. To deceive others, aka the con artist genre, to deceive others is temptation. There is a temptation to deceive. Deception at any level is misrepresenting the truth. And I know this may become a little bit uncomfortable, but I do want to bring this near because you realize that lurking in the heart of all of us is some level, some twinge at some point, the willingness to misrepresent the truth. There's some good Bible stories about this. Uh, near the, the end of his father's life, Jacob was sorely tempted to rob the, the, the blessing of the firstborn. And so he, um, he deceived his father into receiving the blessing of the firstborn. And Jacob's name at that time meant supplanter or substitute because he deceived to the point of blocking the flow of God's blessing in his brother's life. And it took 30 years for Jacob to come back to a place of restoration after the great deception. On the other side of the scale, there's another Bible story, which you may be familiar with, Samson, a Nazarite, um, one of the judges of Israel, God used literally in physical prowess and strength. And the secret of his strength was that he should not cut his hair. Now, I believe that it's more than a symbolism or kind of some magical supernatural thing. But a Nazarite took a vow never to cut his hair. It was a sign of honor that he was serving God. And so uh, this was his secret. His vulnerability, his downfall, his Achilles heel was that he loved Philistine women. And so he dabbled with the Philistine women, toyed with them, but never gave away his secret until he met Delilah. Delilah was different because he loved her. And she was different too because she knew how to nag to such a point that he gave up his secret, even though he knew she was deceiving him. Temptation can be incredibly enticing. Uh, Craig Grishel from Open Life Church says, uh, temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. So if you want to look at your life and look at this, this, um, this whole life lesson of temptation, what is threatening your obedience to God? In what areas of your life are, are you being challenged or persuaded or enticed to move in a different direction. 1 John 2 verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, 
is not of the Father, but is of the world. And this really unpacks what temptation is all about. Temptation feeds the desire to experience in the lust of the flesh in ways that doesn't honor God. Temptations feed the desire to possess what you see, the lust of the eyes. Temptation feeds the desire to dominate, control, and assert yourself. So ego issues, pride of life, uh, dominate the pursuit of self-gain at all costs. Yes, some of God's truths about temptation. Firstly, it's not a sin to be tempted. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So it is not a sin to be tempted, but the con artist movie reminds us that we can be tempted, we will be tempted, and we need to respond in a way that honors God. The second truth regarding temptations is you are never above temptation. Um, very simply from Hebrews, it says, therefore, let him who think he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful that you think you're invincible because there's a moment where you will be vulnerable, where you'll be tired, where you'll be angry or hungry enough to step in a direction that doesn't please God and ultimately sabotages God's work and God's purpose in your life. You are never above temptation. I've told this story before, but um, Gordon MacDonald, a wonderful American pastor, teacher and author, makes the statement, an unguarded strength becomes a double weakness. In his ministry, he would always say kind of one of the, the cornerstones of strength in his ministry was his relationship with his wife. And Gordon was, had, had great favor, was traveling all over the country, even all over the world. And Gordon landed up having an affair with his personal assistant. And when it was exposed, he took a two-year sabbatical from ministry, made himself accountable to a group of trusted friends where he was able to kind of tear down the veneer of the pride of life, of the issues that had brought him to this place. And also to rebuild a relationship with his wife. And it's beautiful to see, um, to come across his writings now, how he and his wife, Gail, are still forging strongly ahead. I've been reminded of this because this, this theme of temptation and deception that comes up so strongly in the con artist genre is so much part of, if you like, the dark side of our humanity. And if we don't learn to tell ourselves the truth, we can step across this line over and over again. And as I've been in prayer this week, I've specifically been in prayer for people, um, married people, for people in committed relationships, where you begin to deceive your partner, whether it's with online pornography, whether it's flirting with someone um, online or in the office, there's, there's a point where you're succumbing to enticement and you need to stop in your tracks and redirect to honoring God, to honoring your wife or your husband, to honoring your partner. So temptation is not, to be tempted is not a sin. The second truth is you are never above temptation. And the third truth that I really want to bring home is that there is always a way out. And, and you read this also in Hebrews, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. And this word idolatry, um, the original word is flee covetousness. A lot of deception and temptation comes from wanting or lusting for something you don't have. The corner office, the boss's wife, whatever it is, um, the, the grass we think is green on the other side, and we have to learn to celebrate the greenness of the grass in our own lives. So I want to encourage you, every time you make a stand against the temptation in front of you, 
you strengthen your overcomer muscle. You begin to learn to stand firm and overcome so that the pull and the power of temptation becomes less and less. So these life lessons uh, we, we, we can draw so much from. We are wired to be part of something bigger. The second life lesson is the power of temptation is so enticing. The third life lesson is that self-gain and the pursuit of self-gain is super seductive. The pursuit of self-gain at all costs, the way the con artists pursue self-gain at all costs, is completely counter to the life of the follower of Jesus Christ. But it's deeply embedded in our culture, guys. So in some respects, we've got to wake up and listen to the messages of our culture and realize some of this is completely different to the way God is calling us to live, to be, and to think. We're either going to be driven by our ego needs, by us, uh, what, what we want to accomplish in life, or we're going to be driven by what God wants from us and what God offers us in terms of open doors and pursuing his will, his kingdom, his ways. God's truth here regarding self-gain and the pursuit of self-gain is completely counter, as I've said. Two truths I want to mention. One is the, 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 the Bible landscape is filled with this principle. Always prefer others. Always put yourself, put others ahead of yourself. And so you, you see it's so counter uh, with the con art, art, artist genre, of course, but also with... Um, pursuing temptation, giving in to temptation, is often at the cost of someone in our lives. So always prefer others. Jesus, the epitome of this, and you can read about this in Philippians 2, his journey to the cross and everything it involved. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, humility of mind, let each esteem others better than yourself. Now, this is not some kind of self-abnegation where uh, you just don't consider yourself good enough or worthy enough. This is an enlightened, transformative humility where I am driven not by what I can simply get out of a situation or a relationship, but I am driven to consider the needs and the wants of the people round about me so that together we can grow to new places in God. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. The second truth that I want to share here in terms of uh, the choice of being driven by self-gain or being driven by what God wants is sow what you want to reap. And when you begin to just imbibe this as a life principle, it changes all of your words, your actions, it changes how you come into situations and even how you leave them. Matthew 6 verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And God actually, Jesus, through his, his magnificent Sermon on the Mount, he says, lay aside all your own self-seeking. Don't worry what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about tomorrow. Seek the kingdom of God and I'll make sure you're taken care of. So God's truth in the face of this, this very seductive self-gain pursuit, God's truth is so what you want to reap. So to the kingdom, so to the ways of God. And you will reap an abundant harvest, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Now, in closing, I want to invite you to, to get your communion elements and I want to invite you to come to the table and ask Jesus to illuminate the, the, the workings of your inner man, your mind, your heart, your motives, your intents, the places of failure, perhaps, where you've succumbed to temptation, even the temptation to, um, to lash out in anger even the temptation to despair, to give up, 
because you're tired of holding on and waiting to see how God is going to come through. Come to the table and ask Jesus to shine a light, a light on your inner man. John 8 verse 12, Jesus said, um, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light and he comes even into those places that we think are just a little, um, a little shaded, a little grayed. Jesus comes to bring an, an illuminating life so that as we open up to the light of the world, there's a transformation that happens in us so that what we want begins to change. Our desires, our motivations begin to be transformed. And I want to encourage you as we come to the bread of life, to break the bread of life, is to ask Jesus to come and and, and bring conviction in the areas that you, you, you need that light to shine brightly. And in that place, let's ask him for forgiveness, for a complete cleansing of every failure point. Because you see, God doesn't want you living in condemnation. He doesn't want you living in shame or in fear that you're going to continue the cycle. God wants to come to interrupt the negative, destructive, toxic cycles in our lives so that we can be testimonies and light bearers of the great light of the world. So here I have my little wafer and I'm going to invite you to take the bread of life and as you eat it, take a moment to ask God to examine the interior of your heart and to do that business with him where you ask forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, your word says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Your word also says that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our iniquities from us. So beloved, coming to the light, come to rest in the light. We are not cockroaches scurrying from the light. We are light bearers coming into the light to be transformed and illuminated even more. I want to encourage you to take into your prayer of the week that you'd ask Jesus to illuminate the path of your life so that you would see as he sees and that you would see him for who he really is. You see, when we learn to see as he sees, we learn to love what Jesus loves and we learn to hate what Jesus hates when we see who he really is we want to grow up in the fullness of the likeness of being conformed to the lover of our souls so my friends as we take the cup of blessing I want to just speak the blessing of the path of life that God has before you take and drink deeply of his life in Jesus name And now let me just speak the blessing of God over you. May God lift up his face upon you. May you know the smile of God in your life. May he lift you up and be your burden bearer in the places where you need support and strengthening. May he make your path straight so that you would not strain an ankle, you would not dislocate a limb but that you would walk and make progress in the things of God as he illuminates your path of life. In Jesus' name, for his glory. Thanks so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful and blessed week.